Premier he was uh, very talented, as, as uh, I've shown all the Aboriginals. Look at that for a torpedo punt. That would have been a 60 or 70 metre torpedo punt. Casper Muir, he, uh, he had a profound effect on me as a youngster. I, I would have been, um, you know, 10 years old, 11 years old, maybe even nine. And, um, and, and to watch him play, the smoothness and um, the wiriness of him, it was just, he's one of the players from that period that stand out and actually grabbed my attention as a youngster to actually watch him play football. How many games he played? Oh, look, he, he played somewhere in the vicinity of, you know, 30 odd games, a couple of seasons. He, he wasn't a long term type player, but he, he was, as a, as a youngster, um, he really just stood out because of his wiriness. And uh, in fact, Gilbert McAdam, when he played later on for Central Districts, uh, reminded me a little bit about the movement that um, that Casper uh, had. And uh, of course, as a youngster, there was um, um, watching the television, seeing you know Casper the Ghost, and then seeing you know Casper as a nickname. It, it, it sort of attracted me as a youngster to him as well. Uh, and I remember sort of uh, going in there at, uh, at the huddle at uh, three quarter time to to look at this guy because he was larger than life and uh, to a youngster. And uh, so he's always, um, he made it such an impression that I'm always, when I look back at that period, he's one name that sort of pops up. And he, he was a, a guy that just, even when you were standing him, with the arm, he could, he could lose you, you know? He'd read the ball, and wonderful anticipation. Boss a chance, Boss has broken clear, left foot's high into the air. To get under this Stutley, from yes, Stutley. He, was a, he was a good player, um, really, really good player, tough halfback. Yeah, you know. He would have been, uh, you know, you can go through these play like uh, Mal Holland and Stutley and Wendell and all of these players. It's, uh, the first, after the first year, um, they gave more confidence with Grilicic and that, and that was what changed the club. 65, and that's why I had such a good year. He was brilliant, Tom Grewers, it sent half forward, sent half back. Big, strong bloke, you know, and uh, they used to rubbish me because I feed off him. I just go past the hand balls, and, but he was brilliant. And he made a big difference to Centrals. He was really good. Tom Grewers, I, I, I realised and said to the, the committee, it was very good, we need a couple of big, stronger players. And Grewers has got uh, recommended me, Dennis Barron and, and uh, Tom Grewers, I recommend, I forget who. I remember just averting a little bit. I, I went, flew over there to, to, to see him, meet him. And his brother, George Grilicic, was uh, a, a lawyer and on, uh, I think, ABC Radio. And, and Tom was the brother. And apparently, the Yugoslav family tradition, the elder gets the, the, all the, the, ed, the, 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 the education. And after that, there's not a worry on the worker. So uh, I went out to their. Uh, they were growing potatoes or onions or something for their, their farm, so I went out there and um, Tom was, looked like a, a great uh, <laughs> wrestler uh, with a beautiful body. He just had a pair of shorts and hot and just picking bags of onions up and throwing them all out as if they were nothing. I thought, gee, this is the strongest guy I've seen and that. And I was told he could play football and, uh, and he could also stand his ground. And uh, anyway, I started talking to him and uh, his father, came out of the shed and uh, uh, told me to go, get off the property. And I stayed for a while and he said, just one more chance and I'll go and get my gun and shoot you. <laughs> and I, they say they would. So I, I got back to my car and I yelled out to him <laughs> that was a lot of money. Tom, if you do want to come, it's a thousand pound. I remember saying that because uh, I knew he was only getting two pound a week or some work for his father, <laughs> and nothing from his footy club. And that was I told you, Central's that year '65. We we got going and we won games, and all of a sudden I'm getting votes. Yeah, when I won the medal, just going on that because I can remember that you would never understand what happened that night when I won the medal. I was at the show or something. Come home. It was just the first time it was televised, but only on TV. The count. 
and uh, Colin Richards of the Bay said, you were, yeah, you think you'll go? I said, oh, no, you have no hope with us. We don't win enough games. Go home and watch it. So I did. We come home, grabbed the kids from the show, went home to watch it, and the cut a long story short, I won it by one vote from Neil Curley, which was amazing. But with the second that was announced, the phone was ringing, there were calls from Darwin, Melbourne, there was cops out the front, ambulances, the council brought kegs around, and there would have been 1,500 people knocking down the door in our little trust home, it, and it stayed like that all night. Next day, well, I won't tell you, we found lying around out on the back lawn and in beds, some real big names there, just wiped themselves out. What a night, and that was just because the first one uh, was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I was two votes behind in the last game or something, that close, and it comes out and they go, Central Districts, one vote, um, Torrens, two votes, three votes, Gary Window. Well, just, just claps. And that's what I said when all hell blows. And you still don't believe it takes days to even to get through, but it certainly changed my life, <laughs> that's for sure, for the better. What happened in 1965 is... Uh, uh, the club won its first game of league football in round two. Uh, they beat Woodville. They lost round one, I believe, to North Adelaide. Then they lost about eight games. Now, that was a year that uh, Tom Gorsuch came over to the club. But there were some problems with clearances, and he didn't play early in the season. But once he got into the, uh, the side about a third, halfway through the season, he, uh, he started to have an impact, and he, he probably filled the team with confidence because they started winning games. and. Uh, you know, they beat sort of so many clubs like West Adelaide and, you know, West Towns and, you know, a number of these types of clubs. And they won numerous games on the trot, three games on a row. That, then they might have lost a game, then won a few more. Uh, they knocked off Norwood in a huge game, as, as we've heard uh, the, the, the uh, story about the, the money if they win and things like that. We're offered £500 uh, if we can beat Norwood to, uh, for Sturt. Uh, for Sturt to make the finals. And we were probably only a couple of games from, from making, the, uh, uh, making the, 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 the five, I think they had at that time. Um, and um, we were on a roll because we were handballing, and we were playing a good style of football. But uh, the, the, we got it and we beat them on Adelaide Oval and I think by two points or three points. A horrendous game. <laughs> and that was a motivation, that plus the 500 pound. And I didn't know until probably last year that uh, I thought the team manager got the 500 to distribute amongst the players, and I just thought they had it. But all the time they thought I had the 500 and took it, put it in my pocket. But none of us got it, so they didn't pay. <laughs> Do you remember the 500 quid? A kid asked me about that last year. I said, well, I didn't get anything off. <laughs> so that's when he found out? Yeah, he said that so everyone thought someone else had it, but it's 500 because we beat Norwood. That was great, beating them on the, I think it was Adelaide, over. yeah, but it was a real stormy day. But, uh, yeah, that's one of those little things that go by, but no one got the money. Uh, 66 uh, uh, was a little bit harder, uh, a little bit harder in some ways, but because we were taken more seriously. So, yeah, the... the uh, the run that you had, you thought uh, you had to go harder then because they took more seriously. And you've got, as you see, these players here. They were, they were talented. Uh, by this time, they were talented league league players, you know. And so they uh, it was only their confidence they needed to break and uh, to get down. But the, uh, the Gary Smith, here's another good player. See so all, all of these players in another side at, at the time. Um, Jack is right there. We always had good players. We always had terrific players, but didn't have that full team effort, probably because it was um, so early in our, all our careers. But uh, and your self belief. Yeah, well, it's just as a team, but didn't know we were against better teams too. You get the Port Adelaide's and all those sides been there. Well, Port Adelaide are a prime example. Norwood, and that. they had very experienced teams. We had none of that, so you're just battling on your youth and ex you know, exuberance to try to get over it, and it doesn't work all the time. You have the odd win, but. Uh, they were good players. In other sides, a lot of them kids would have been brilliant, but they, they had to battle. They had to be the seniors of our side. I, I, funny, though, how you talk about it, and you never know with yourself, it's just getting older, but I was never scared of anything. I had um, Lindsay Head in my first league game, and I was captain, because <laughs> Ken couldn't play. Um, it was an excitement for me, but you knew what you were up against. And I know that day, Lindsay Head and Ken was dead right. See, what, 
you know, all of us have played footy. You know, if you've uh, got a winning team kicking 25 goals and you're kicking five, you, you're not doing too much attacking moves. If I was playing centre, well, we had to in those days, I'd do a lot of defensive work because I knew I had to get back and block them off. So they'd do. then you'd have to try to make the break. If you've got someone you could see, you got, then you'd go through half forward trying to make a break to kick a goal. But with Head, he was so brilliant as a ball player, you'd, you'd block him while you're with him and on him. You could, you could blow your own, you think you're going all right. But once you moved a yard off him and the Eagles players give him the ball, he's gone. Then he's such a brilliant kick, he'd kill you. Oh, he's a brilliant player. But man on oh man, you could do all right. But I had struck him, Boyd, Halbert, every week, that's who I was getting. I always remember when Ken... As I said, put every week, you're on board this week. You're on John Albert this week. It was amazing. But what, what an experience. And I just enjoyed it because, but I still play like If I was down Mount Gambier, playing for Salisbury North or playing in Centrals in the seconds, it didn't matter. If my main aim all the time was to beat my opponent. It didn't matter who. The names don't come into it, but uh, it was still hard then. I just, that brought back memories of that first league game. They killed us, but afterwards I was just happy I'd played the game, played our first league game. But it was hard, and a lot of the lads did, did get a lot of pressure on them because, you know, if you don't perform, you get dropped, and then a lot of them are good players, but then just didn't see the way. So uh, very difficult. Hard for Ken watching, wouldn't it be? It'd be hard for him watching. The way competitive was, he'd be see that happening. That would be difficult. Uh, just, just I'm guessing, Donnie kicked two goals. He's a dead eyed dick. Yeah. And Tracy Braidwood uh, said to him, take one more mark, kick one more, oh, knock your fucking head off. <laughs> and he, he did, but he, 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 and we went, they, they'd sort of gathered, uh, West Times had sort of worked it out, and they were just taking the ball away, so he was isolated as well. But uh, I had to stay, stand out for six weeks, um, and I was prepared to do that. Uh, then I was, I, was, I was faced with the, harsh, harsh reality of giving an address to the uh, uh, players and uh, not being able to play yourself, not knowing and knowing that they're going to hammer hell out of us. Uh, to their credit, they, they basically did it. They, they, you can't imagine the fear of some of those young guys, uh, uh, young Townsend, you know, he got, um, he's a brilliant young player and he got hit. He in was. The first, uh, quad and never played again, you know, in, in, in the kidney. You know, in the, Lost a kidney out of it, and so he got injured badly. And uh, the uh, eagle was threatened, and uh, um, at half time they were sort of they were bewildered, you know. And I was trying to exaggerate the thing, and I said, "Well, if you've got to hit or kick or do what you like, just, just fight and scratch and kick as much as you can." You, you remember the speech? What did he say? Oh yeah, no, that's right. Well, that was Ken to a T. Well, what can he do? We're going to get killed. He knows we're getting killed, and half time and. Can reverse the way he played the football is well if you, your ability is not good you can't run and score so then you've got to put body on body you've got to hit people <coughs> bounce off people be rough be tough you've got to and you do and uh, I know I took that to a tee you'd scrag and jump on people the ball was there going head first and try to thump someone and when they blink and have a go if you're mad you say yeah you're mad your mouth off and you had to get some and uh, he was trying to get that out of us so that. So all you could do, and in them days you could probably do it better than now because if it was always known if you're a weak side, well, you, you, after half time you're in trouble, you start building people, you start mm. knocking people around, and that's what you could do. Time on a tradition. <laughs> it wasn't literally, but some of the people that were listening in, so I, I, I instructed them to kick people, which I didn't do. Didn't, that, didn't no, I didn't. So I said, you've got to fight and scratch and kick. kick Sorry, on he, he didn't? No, people to, to take Ken, us as footballers knew exactly what he meant. He said, you got to kick, scratch, and people took it the wrong way, as they always do in the media and that. They say that he told, go out and kick Torrance players, which wasn't. It was a matter of being roughing them up and getting in and, and give them the works. But I said, you've got to fight and scratch and kick, just kick it off the ground, do whatever you've got to do. <coughs> and, uh, so that uh, um, was a lesson I knew I had to have. He was a fantastic coach. I've, <laughs> To take that job on, you can see now, it was courage to take on a new team like that with a champion that he was and get a new mob of lads and we're all just mostly local, thrown into that um, into a side and you've got to get them going. Well, Ken, I know what he did. He did it by his own ability and uh, which amazed us so much. He was so tough. He didn't end up, he was so frustrated, he'd be three quarter time say to us, we've got to do this, you've got to get the ball and handball, get the thing running and going, oh, blow it, just watch me. And out he'd go, 
And we go at the wing and you see a wingman, bang, go down. All of a sudden, what's going on? Care to be going mad, whacking through blokes. And so we all better do something. So he, he was so good to himself that he, and like he said, he probably didn't want to really be a coach, but uh, uh, he was good at it. But he wasn't mouthing off that all the time, but he went back to his ability to show you how to do it, which was great. One thing that uh, uh, Gary said was that, that Ken, he, wanted, he led from the front. He was a good leader, but he was more suited to being a player than a coach. And whenever I think back to my, my youth and I think of um, Ken Eustace, um, what did I know? I was just a youngster. But when Dennis Jones took over as coach, and I remember through this, especially 1970 and 71, and the inspiration, the inspiration way he was a coach, the way he led as a coach, the way he taught players, the way he nurtured youngsters, uh, and he was an actual coach. Yeah, and it's sort of like, to me, it, it put Ken into a, a, more of a, a background type of picture, uh, more in the sense of that I was probably younger. But listening to Gary, I realise now that Ken was very good for Centrals at that time because we needed someone, a captain, mm. and, and to lead on the field. And that's what Ken supplied. But I suppose in the old days of trying to get clearances, et cetera, et cetera, for top-notch players, by being appointed coach, that was probably one, one way of getting in there. Plus, you know, who would want to coach a team, a new team, who's got no prospects of making finals? So an established coach wasn't going to come across. So it was probably a very well thought out to get someone like Ken. But while some people may say that Ken can't coach, what he did as coach of Central District was probably one of the most important things to help establish the club. And that was lead them on the field? Absolutely. When I got my clearance, <coughs> we played against Sturt, and um, I put in a very good first half, and we were ahead of them, um, or very close to it, and had them, had them on their back foot. And uh, I, was, I was tiring, because I hadn't played a game for six weeks, I was, I was the first of the year. And uh, I remember I was, I was running, I was running out to the wing. I'd had a had a good day, and it was just before half time. Had a good uh, uh, playing well, and we were running well. And I saw a ball out there, and I didn't think I could quite get it. And there's a player coming this way, and I I, I reached out to to uh, I, I was either going to fall on it or, or kick it. And I kicked it off, went to kick it off the ground, and the bloody player came through there and damaged it there. I was out, to, to, did my knee, in, and uh, that I carried that for the rest of the year. You know, it was a we then but we had the feel of it, and uh, uh, and then the uh, when I uh, uh, was playing the state team and in, in, in sixty, I think I went to Tasmania. Um, that was sixty five. Um, I let them have their head, you know. They just just let them. Uh, Trevor Jarman was a uh, assistant coach, and he's a uh, second coach, and he got to know that he was one of the drinking partners with Daly and Carl on a Friday night, uh, but he. It's kind of, I said, just said, let, let them have their head, and, and sometimes you've got to do that. And they did, and they, they did well, and we kicked on from there. And it was just bad luck. We, we, got, uh, we got rolled down at Glenelg. Sort of the breaking point, we had, uh, we had Glenelg on toast to sort of really consolidate our, our position. Uh, we lost it, but we still had a, had a wonderful year. Then in 1966, we had to regroup and try to build on it, and the other, other sides were aware of it. And, and I think we were probably uh, probably ahead of all other clubs except for Sturt for handballing, you know. And, um, like Jack Ady Foster would have loved to have had half that side in their, in their team, you know. But that's the, but the, they, were, um, they were the um, pioneers. So pioneers always end up with arrows at the backside. <laughs> but the pioneers, they couldn't get the, um, uh, the recognition not being in the established sides. Uh, until they uh, until they got a pattern of play, he died. He died at about 40, 38 or 40. He died. Yeah, he was a good left footer. Who's he talking about? Brian Dixon. Um, I remember Brian. Um, his dad, Norm Dixon, had the uh, the deli in John Street, Salisbury, and uh, yeah, it was a shock when he died. He was young. He wouldn't have been. He wouldn't have been 50. He would have been in his 40s, and he was just a big friendly fellow, always had a smile on his face. How many youth 
the uh, 60s Centrals people are still left? Oh, look, the, um, <clears throat> obviously we're talking about um, you know, up to 100 players. Um, uh, off the field, they're, they're starting to uh, you know, peel away. Uh, Norm Russell obviously passed away this year and um, uh, a number of the, uh, the, the people involved in that, uh, that, that, that era have gone away. I know when Robin Mulholland and myself wrote uh, Pomps the Premiers, uh, which was released in 2009, we interviewed uh, uh, key personnel at the start at the club and um, there would have been five or six of those people who have now passed on. So it was very fortunate that we, um, we did interview them when we did because they, um, the memories were, 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 were okay to good um, and they gave us a lot of good information. They gave us con contrasting stories, which I thought helped Pomps to Premiers because it gave different views on certain aspects of the development of uh, getting Central District into league football. That's just uh, uh, nerves and pressure going to win. I think of it to try it, wondering whether they can win or not still. They're probably in the back That's of the right. That's why we won those uh, premierships in 2000, was well, because we had those uh, AFL players. That was the first time we'd had experienced players. It, it was worked brilliant for us. There was a Guerra, Cochrane, there was three AFL players from the power dropped back to our side. And that's why we went top. Well, one of the big reasons with the Gowans boys too. But with that, we all of a sudden we had as good of players, experienced players as any other side. And that, that's what we didn't, Ken Eustace didn't have there. Mm. He's trying to get us all to play together and we're all individuals really. And I think in the first year and part of the second year, part of the second year, they didn't believe, uh, they didn't have that self-belief, even though they don't actually train much. They, they, they read the paper or, or they felt that they uh, were a bottom side and they had a, this mental fear, not a, not a fright, but a fear of uh, the skill on the other side, you know, the, the established side, particularly the Norwood, the Sturt, and Port Adelaide and that, they uh, I thought, God, they, they sort of had this, um, a little bit of a psychological edge on, on players that shouldn't have had it, you know. So this guy would have made any side uh, a window and uh, Stutley and uh, Maury. Sonny was a, um, I still see him, he still, still looks as fit enough to play. Sonny was a, uh, um, Sonny was a, um, just a, I guess he had nerves inside, but he was the coolest, calmest person you'd ever you'd ever see, I've ever seen a football field and put him in the back pocket. Yeah, one of the best old Sonny. He, he was, uh, which years did he play? He was there in 64, he uh, started our first league side, played as a wingman when he first came there, I don't know when he went to the back pocket but he's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, he's, uh, his kicking was sensational, Ken's hit it right on the head, cool, he's just a sensational footballer. Today he'd be worth anything. If old Buddy can get a million dollars, well, Sonny might too. No, he was, a, he was a brilliant player, cool. Always under, under pressure, would do nothing wrong, and his kicks, it wouldn't matter if it was 30 metres or 60 metres, he'd hit you. Uh, no, he was a fantastic player. We were lucky to have him, that's for sure. Oh, look, Sonny Moy was just, you know, the, I mean, Gary Windows, Mr Bulldog. Well, you know, Sonny Moy, he's just, Mr. Reliable, he was just, I remember him, him as a dashing uh, wingman and uh, I think as a wingman he was uh, he was an average league footballer. Uh, but when he went to the back pocket, he was just sensational. He, it changed his career, he became just as a regular A-grade player to a first choice league player. Uh, I remember sort of uh, around about 1970, 71, 72, through that period, he was finishing his um, career as a, as a wingman, half-back, half-forward type player. Uh, played reserves footy, uh, probably more reserves in the league for, for a, a while there. And then all of a sudden he, he burst on the scene as a, as a back pocket and he, he just, he had that pace that he used out of the back pocket. He had that toughness to uh, hold the position down. And uh, he was actually uh, runner-up 
for the uh, McGowey medal and he made the state team and... Uh, out of a back pocket. Out of a back pocket. And, um, you know, if I was going to liken him, uh, I remember an opposition player, uh, Bubba Wobbs, played for Port Adelaide. And uh, in a way, that type of um, build, that type of um, uh, coming out of defence, uh, tough defender, uh, reminded me. You know, it suddenly reminded me of him. And But Sonny also, having played on the wing, had that little bit more of a pace as well, the, the, uh, the longer pace. I mean, uh, a lot of people have that 10-yard speed. Well, well, you know, Sonny had that initial speed, but he would continue it longer. And it's the one thing I remember. And he quite often sort of come out of the back pocket, sort of ran it out, kicked onto the wing to Peter Vivian, who had pace to burn, kicked it forward, and then Sally Sable would take a mark and kick a goal there. And he just, I, I didn't really, I don't think I really specifically coached him. Might have given you some pointers, but here's one that you just sort of let go, you know, and the window is another one. But Sonny was a, a, just a natural person that could judge the ball 50 metres out, and he could be there. And there's another player called Dennis Barron we brought over. He was quite a good ruck rover. And, um, uh, and uh, Skinner. Yeah, Andrews, he was, he was another guy, this was a really reliable guy, beefy, beefy Andrews they called him. And, uh, There's a kick coming out yeah, there's the Statley and Daly and Maury and Window and uh, yeah. Mel Holland was a good player, but he wasn't under my, my uh, yeah. 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 He was a good player, the short, Keith Shorthill came out from uh, uh, Western Australia from Perth. I think this is a game he's about to get a broken jaw. <laughs> yeah, he's got reported twice. Yeah. <laughs> no comment, good comment, Wally. That was a. That was a the, and then, of course, the, fight, the return game down at Glen Earl, um, uh, two of the ruckmen, um, uh, two of the central guys, uh, decided to uh, repay Neil and jumped in and broke his jaw. Uh, at, at, at the bounce, you know, didn't even go for the ball. He didn't break Neil's jaw. And uh, uh, Neil, uh, Neil Stutley, he was a good player here. Yeah. Going half time, and Neil. Gets the, he couldn't talk, get the, the trainer. He said, go and get a box of chewing gum, you know. And he gave four or five players, uh, Rose, Rose and Will and uh, the chew chewing gum, gave it to him. He, he patted his mouth up with chewing gum, like that. Yeah. And uh, like, pain was bloody unbelievable. And uh, go out to bounce the ball for the first time. <laughs> The ruckman the, 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 <laughs> thought they'd seen a ghost. Then if it can come back, and it was a bad break, you know. And he was just like, straight, straight, straight back, you know. <laughs> In fact, you talk about, everyone knows Neil, Neil Curley, but tough man. One of the toughest, he was, he was unbelievable for his size. Uh, yeah, Curley, you couldn't go past him and people don't understand watching football nowadays to watch him where Curley played, taking on the Vicks or any in the CSA. Uh, he intimidated everyone because he was just so tough. He, he wouldn't stop and he, he'd bluff everyone out. That was one of his big goals, but he could carry on with it. But his ruck work, for a, not a real a tall bloke, but he was so tough and he used to just take them all on. And some of his games against Victoria were just classics uh, to watch and beat the people up brass in all those toughies that we all knew about and take them on was fantastic. This is the team to be going under quite comfortably. Not a good knock catch him. Towards the full forward pocket, but he's been at flash down there at full forward. Uh, at centre, in the centre of the ground, and it's in trouble. Is Jackson, the central district. Yeah, I got King hit that day. Yeah, that one. Looking at the full face of the goal, he's simply been good 60, 70 yards out, goes for the distance. Players scream out, Pitovich from behind, up his view over the mark, take him out. Is that Daly? Taken by the central district's captain for mine. We grew up in the cabin homes, me and Mick Daly. That's how we, know. we were. I think we were the only two that come through from the uh, seconds into the league side. 
uh, Mick, but we lived in the cab homes. They were, they were the old asbestos homes in Salisbury by the Salisbury Oval there years ago. So the dailies and the windows came from there and we ended up out there. Jeff Daly was the star at Salisbury North in them days, Mick's older brother. He was the most brilliant footballer around and he didn't get into central side. It was amazing. But it used to be in the pub on Friday nights with Buddha Jarman and all those, <laughs> putting bets on race horses. Yeah, John, yeah, he was another tough player. Hell, he's, he's tough. Now there is a good player. Kevin Johns, I think he mentioned then, Ken, and he would love him because he's a bit like Ken himself. Mad, going head first, but really tough and a great kick. Uh, Kevin Johns, he's one of the best ones we had, Johnsy. He was brilliant. Having uh, the first time I watched this uh, 1968 um, game against Glenelg and, and I heard the chart come up, I, I started asking a few questions and found out it was there from the start. And, um, oh yeah, we've always had. See, when we first, that's why the, the book um, Poms the Premiers was so good, that was a very apt title. The boys that, that thought that up was brilliant because when you look at that, that's exactly what it was. When we started, out there at the New Elizabeth, all the trust homes, all the English migrants were there. And they wanted something to do, so they followed the footy. They come to us, even the seconds, and their chants and their singing were absolutely amazing, even in them, them day. It was really appreciated, and everyone used to call us Poms. Like me and Sonny Moore, we're as dark as the Ace of Spades, and yet we're called Poms. Everyone, you pommy bastards, you know. But it was terrific, and those, those supporters started us off, and they were, they were sensational. And they kept it going over the years. Mm. Some of them chants over the it got years. Got bigger. Oh, it did. Great. And that's what's made Centrals what they are. They've not only had the, the, the success now, but those supporters deserve a medal. They've been brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, they, 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 they had that, well, they, they had that really, that ch uh, chant from the, virtually from uh, day one when I was out there. But it got bigger and stronger and more, more uh, organised. But they had uh, the girls just uh, dancing and they don't be chanting down the end. Centrals had a very good, uh, it was wonderful for the, you know, for South Australia, but wonderful for Elizabeth because they, the English, most of the English people followed, that was their, that was their side, and um, they followed it as if it was a UK soccer team. They'd had all the chants and all of that, and, they, and it, it helped weld the society. The best one they ever done was you dog, you dog. Right the Jackson, that's right. Yeah, he's a good player. And uh, Vidovich, I don't think Vidovich is in there. I can't yeah. see. He's, he's there. I reckon Vidovich, uh, Vidovich had the ability to be, you know, an 80 or 100 goaler in a, in a good sign. Oh, he was brilliant. Absolutely sensational. Like Ken's put it right there because. Uh, uh, probably didn't give enough supply to him, but he was one of the best kicks you could ever see. Dead eye dick, left footer, beautiful uh, action, and uh, yeah, he's another one that was just out there with so much talent. Uh, he could have been anything in a good side, and this, this happens with everyone, I suppose. I suppose that's what happened to a lot of sides with centrals in those days. I can go through every era there that I've watched, or all those, what, 60 odd years, 70 years that I've been following now, that uh, we've always had brilliant players. You can always go back McAdams, you can go through every year, Duckworth, all the ones that have come through, but we, did, we weren't winning enough games to be there. And you know, in footy, you've got to play in finals, which is fair enough too, was where your names are made when you play in finals. So. Mm. But they certainly had the ability, we've had some crook old players. Rick Vindovich you're talking about, he's a, he was our um, first leading goal kicker of the league. And uh, a little story about Rick, he, um, he tried to go to Western Australia and there was clearance problems, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then he came back and um, he tended to fight around with a lot of local teams. He was at uh, Salisbury West and Barmer Lodge and um, I think he played a little bit of country footy and most of these places he, uh, he was a leading goal kicker in the competitions. But uh, I remember in uh, 1975, um, he played a, some football for... Um, the Salisbury team that I was playing for, and it was my first year of senior football. And we actually won the premiership, and uh, our full forward was uh, Rick Vidovich. And uh, I remember one game he kicked 14 goals, and I 
I think he kicked six in the grand final and uh, freak left footer. And he's a, he's a skilled sportsman in all sport, whether it's tennis, golf, or whatever. He's just a skilled sportsman. Good one going to fall short. Eustace is getting under it. It's gone over Eustace's head. Here comes Bentley. Goes without the ball. That's Jimmy Bentley, he was a tough, tough player. Yeah. Foss Williams would have loved him. Gets around his opponent, brings it across here, but what a good kick. But he'll go into attack this time. The other woods marker. He reaches up, pushed away by Bentley, recovered by Bentley. Bentley short kick marked by Skinner. There's the kick coming up the plate, picked up by Darrell Moss. He's bounced forward, kicked it over half forward. It's up goes Rowe in the middle of the pack, and he's taken a good, strong mark. You can see Kevin Rowe. He was the lead in the sandwich, but he held ground. He short passes coming across here to Ebert. Ebert's got the ball in front of him, can't pick it up. He's tackled. This has given Central's a chance. Central's through Stutley. Stutley's see, Stutley was one of the early ones, and he was a, a tough, rugged player. Really wasn't, you know, country guy. In the second year, we were going pretty well. And Stutz was a, a good half back flanker, and I thought he'd make the state side. But when they, and uh, on the, but he, he was uh, uh, got injured. He was injured, and then his ball put it on his arm. Well, uh, so Sutley uh, uh, got injured and he's out uh, and we won, won, a, won a game in the uh, second year, uh, we won a couple of games and he was a touchy guy and uh, he was due to come back in the side just automatically and somebody put in the advertiser or the advertiser writer put in there um, poser for, for poser for Stutley, many of his opposer, not, not opposer, he was a, as a poser for selectors because somebody else had played well, but he was a, a, a poser for the, he read it wrong and reckoned that we'd set him up and called him a poser. And he got the sulks and wouldn't play for a couple of weeks, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't yeah. dry, yeah. yeah. Jeez, it took us all, everyone saying, look, you're not a poser, that's what the paper said, but didn't they didn't say there's a poser for centrals with Stutley, you know. But he thought it was a poser. But you remember that? <laughs> yeah, I do. Stutz was a very proud man. And uh, he, that's right. Because the way he ran, he did. He stuck his chest out and he looked, he was so confident. And that, I remember the article. And it did, it read as though they were having a go at him. I'd be the same. I reckon Stutz <laughs> took it that way, but it wasn't that. It was just, but it's the way he looked. But he was a strong, healthy, <laughs> going individual. But yeah, he took it the wrong way, old Stutz, those days. And he was a pretty mad man. <laughs> he didn't take it too well. Mm -hmm. From the throw in, Moss still battling hard, but he's given away a free kick, I think, on this occasion. And it's gone to Middleton. Yeah, here's an, uh, see, there's another player I sort of overlooked, but Frankie Middleton, he was a, a terrific uh, ruckman. And uh, he just came from a local area. Going along the flank, Daly sets himself, jostles with a little player, holds the mark, and goes back at centre wing to slow up play. All, it's all central districts, full marks to the for a wonderful display here today. There's the ball along the flank, it's gone out of bounds for a throw in, and the rucks once again. The ground was, uh, we couldn't play on it for a few weeks until um, we got it ready, but the, the ground was. Uh, uh, you know, for wet weather and everything, it's been a very, very good ground the, the whole time. And it's I took the furniture there in a PMG truck. To, Is that true? Uh, yeah. I, old Don Miller, you remember Don? I remember where the uh, concourse is now. That was, on a rainy day, that was mud. So uh, I remember sort of loved going and running up and down there and sliding down in the mud. And, and I remember there was one time I got this vague recollection of uh, my dad making me walk home because I was too muddy to go in the car. So uh, I used to do everything there. We used to work and then I'd run furniture in there. We'd get, we only had little club rooms out the back at the start, little daggy little place. Mm. And then they built the grandstand. I can't remember the years now. Coming into league football, that would have been built the grandstand. But the housing trust over there were always good, mm. really good for uh, centrals. They looked after us and then uh, the councils got behind it and that, that was great, that oval. Yeah. So what was the relationship with the, because of course Elizabeth, a lot of housing trust out there, so they viewed the footy club as sort of an extension of that? Oh yeah, it was all tied together. See, when I came back from, when they got me back from Piri, that was, what was that, whenever it was, 60, 
Uh, see, they got me a house, the housing trust. I thought I was made. Got a double unit trust home at Benham Street, Elizabeth. And that was when all this was going on. But it was all, yeah, one big community. It was really good. Mm. It was really good. One of the things about Gary Window. Now, I, I, I do recall Gary uh, was involved in those um, school camps where we'd come out from uh, our school and we'd uh, have the football camps. That's what they used to call them back there. And the instructional... Um, um, development type thing for youngsters and uh, and Gary was one of the larger life people that were out there and, and Mick Daly and, and, and a few of those guys are involved in the, this period in the 1960s and uh, I think that was huge in getting a lot of the uh, the Elizabeth uh, youngsters at schools to power for Central District and I think one of the best things that could happen for Central District Footy Club was the number of teachers that were playing league football for Centrals. I, I'd already said uh, David Sable, but you had Richard Cochran, you had uh, Beefy Andrews, you had Trevor Stanton who captained the club. These are school teachers that were in the Elizabeth schools. And I'll never forget in, uh, in 1968 when, when David Sable, that was his first year as a teacher, and uh, it was our grade six class. And, and the one thing I remembered from a, a lot of the kids in school was that um, uh, there was a lot of Sturt and Port supporters because they were obviously the, the two teams that always played off in the uh, grand final to us. I mean, for the previous four years, I mean, that's forever when you're uh, at that age. And um, and I remember thinking to myself, um, there was only like um, in my class about three of us actually Barrett for Centrals. And uh, we were a mixed class, boys and girls, you know, about 20 boys, 20 girls. And, um, and uh, I remember when uh, Mr. Saywell uh, first came in and he, he introduced himself as a Central District player and I remember my chest filling with pride that, you know, because I was a Central supporter. And then he asked a question which you don't expect but you cherish and that was, who in this classroom barracks for Central District? And I remember distinctly sticking my hand up in the front of the class thinking to myself, I'm going to be one of the only kids with my uh, hand up. And I looked behind me and every kid in the class had their hand up. And, you know, at the time, uh, the memory was just a ordinary memory. But over the years, when I thought about it further and once I became Central District's historian and looked at history and tried to understand why Central District Footy Club meant so much to the area, I think the school teachers had a lot to do with that because just in that one instance with my class, a lot of those kids stuck their hand up. Now, obviously some would go back and bow it for their ports or sturts or whoever, but I think half that class became lifetime Central District supporters because of his influence there. And uh, I think my theory is that's why Central's had such a close, and to this day, a lot of those kids in my generation, in their 50s, remember fondly about Centrals and have enjoyed the premierships more so because they've been there for the long long ride. And I think it's the school teachers from the uh, Central District's uh, league side of the, uh, through the 60s and early 70s. Rose Wood, Rose Wood onto his left foot along the flank, by a second goal, with the one-arm pass has been pulled in by mix of Central District and Central District are marking well at the moment. They're out marking the Tigers. I, I, I thought they... Uh, I think I've said it a couple of times, but I, I thought the uh, naming of the, it had to promote Central District, but the naming of the, the word naming Central District, it did encompass everything. Very quickly after the first year, once they started winning, uh, the Brossa Valley, Kapunda, they were, they, they, Tanunda didn't even want me to go up there. And I know a lot of people up there, but two years later, they then uh, had got Carl Linder down, big Clary Linder down for a few games, they then started to be, they still had their own club, you weren't the enemy, but they had their uh, district club, which is central district, it encompassed everything. So Salisbury hated the Gawla, Gawla hated Elizabeth, blah, blah, blah. but they all quickly in the first two years encompassed their thoughts and their power and their uh, loyalty to centrals, which is, which is, I thought was the, a clever name by using it, central, it's a political name really. You go anywhere now and, and shortly after we were there, but anyway now, they, like Centrals, there's a, um, they're a fan of Centrals and a fan of their own, own uh, private club, whatever it is, uh, uh, you know, in the area. And I, I, I tried to pass it on to South Adelaide, asked me 
uh, a couple of people in South Adelaide asked me what uh, about who now approaching going down there, and I, I wasn't officially, but I, I said to them that, that I, I told them I said you should change your name to Southern Districts because instead of South Adelaide because the uh, Wollonga hate uh, you know Ranella and Ranella hate so and so you've got to encompass them all under a, 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 a different name. Uh, the uniform name, so that they they can be proud of that, and still have the local uh, team. Oh, and I think you've got to they've got to bite the bullet and do something about uh, the, about that name. You know that they can get it because they're not going they're not going to market that well at, at South Adelaide. He could have been anything, Daly. Um, he had a, a bit of a, a bit of a punting problem, and um, and a, a bit of a um, loyalty to his uh, friends that they would go out drinking on a Thursday or Friday night. Uh, that uh, sort of the, there's four or five of them. That, um, I didn't sort of think Ken knew about that. They'd say no, they weren't, but they were. <laughs> But that wouldn't have happened if those same players had had that uh, problem were in an established side, you know, because the old established players would uh, weren't their mates. They bring them into line. Wickham was one I found hard too. He's a, I trained him as a half back frame, trained him to hang on, get in front and hang on all the time, just to stay in front. Bugging me down, I had to stand him <laughs> for a half in a game when we played against him. They played good football, it's a long time ago, they played good football. They played almost 30 minutes of this final quarter and it must be very, very close to the Elizabeth's crowd up here, the Central Districts, the Bulldogs fans are delirious with excitement. It is back there with Shorty and Joe. Here we